Crack. The door to the helicopter locks to the open position. The latching sound resonates in time with the throbbing of the rotors and the whine of the turbine engine. A hot wind envelops my whole body, seeming to appear out of nowhere. But it's always there, stifling. The heat never goes away. Neither does the earth and the grit, like an old wool blanket that you can't shake off. <clears throat> my legs twitch to release the covers as I attempt to air out my sheets. Crack. Again, the door locks open. This time, the sound in my ears is louder, sharper. It lingers, beating to the drum of the blades. The high-pitched screech is searching for the last corner of my brain that it hasn't been reached yet. <clears throat> I can feel my heart shaking my lungs as I dig deep for breath. Crack. I smell blood. Crack. Beep. It's my alarm clock. My eyes snap open as I gasp for air, trying to purge the copper taste from my throat that still lingers from my dream. I am awake. I can feel my skin rise against my body like a cat on all fours, back arched, cornered by an unexpected animal, not yet sure if they are a friend or a foe. The back of my neck is stuck to my pillowcase. Sweat has locked it in place, like a warm palm on a frozen door handle in winter, only willing to release if applied with the right amount of pressure. I don't move. I don't breathe. I listen for the sound of rotor blades. I listen for the whine of churning engines. I listen. Beep. Only my alarm clock. I am awake. I pry my torso off the sheets, supporting my weight with a cocked elbow. As I swing mechanically for the alarm clock, I feel the heat of my body dissipating. It's autumn, and the timid cool of the season's change is discernible at this hour. I dread the moment my feet contact that cold bedroom floor. A relic of my childhood past, morning was my time to dream. Those beautiful moments after waking up, before I began my day, when I could linger in a state of hazy opportunity, fantasizing about pulling off my first kickflip or that sweet victory accomplished in the lunchtime snack trade, not having to exert any effort into completing the tasks ahead, but rather relish in the certitude that, of course, everything would work out as designed. <clears throat> the moment my feet hit the floor, though, fantasy swiftly turns to reality. Begrudgingly, I must go forth to showers, breakfasts, car rides to school, teachers, lunch lines, etc., etc. It's funny to me that I'm still in school. It's fall, and I'm three weeks into my courses at community college. It has been 11 months, 24 days since I left the military. Now in my second semester, student life has yet again filled my days with the same activities of my childhood. Waking up, showering, breakfast, taking the bus to school. All of those things that were so innocent in the abstract and less enjoyable in practicality as a kid, now, without innocence, followed in the same manner, although different. Everything is different. Everything has changed. I can feel my body trying to adapt to my conscious state, clicking like a scratch CD in an old disc man, my anxiety snapping on and off like a broken lighter of a rusty grill. Still balancing on my elbow, immediately my thoughts turn to the day ahead. What are my goals? What is my mission? Youthful anxiety has evolved into a crippling need for a plan. I must know every step required by my day now before I take it. Every event analyzed, every move deliberate, Nothing could be so casually approached, because I know what complacency could do. I have seen it. Shower. That is the first task of the day, although just getting out of bed will be tough. The security of my bed is known to me. That floor invites confusion and invites chaos. While I know I must execute a proper morning hygiene routine, the cramped shower is not inviting. The hot steam filling my lungs and constricting my blood vessels <clears throat> in my chest reminds me of boot camp. I'm breathing in CS gas in a darkened room with one light above, mucus flowing from my nose past my lips as they sound out my third general order. I struggle with my eyelids like prying clamshell packaging open to get to the new electronic gadget inside. The beating of the water drops from the shower are rhythmic, dull, constant, like the rotors of the helicopter. Hot air is swimming around my face. I'm a product of that heat. I have become it. Crack. Every drop of water slamming into the white acrylic bottom of my bathtub is another helo door locking back, another round being fired downrange. Crack, crack, the bullets fly, thump, thump, the rotors turn, and the hot, sticky water beating off my skin drips downward. I smell blood. <clears throat> crack, the box of cereal lands on the countertop 
after being disturbed from its night of slumber above my refrigerator. It's breakfast time. Yes, that would be next on my list of objectives. Breakfast is no longer an enjoyable break in the morning routine. It is a function. It serves a purpose. My body is a machine, and a machine must have fuel to run. I know this. I know this because I am a mechanic. I am a mechanic of the human body. And just like a machine, the human body, when it is broken, can be fixed. Just like the mechanic, the medic fixes it. The mechanic can replace an engine gasket when it is blown. I can reinflate the lung of a 19-year-old Marine after it has been pierced by a 7.62 millimeter round hurled from an AK-47. Like a mechanics, my hands work off muscle memory, locating the entry site from the pool of blood collecting under the cover of his BDU. I listen for the muted gargle of air escaping his lungs. I smell the sweet copper stench of blood mixed with lingering sulfur. I can see the pinkish bubbles forming, forth, forming forth from the glistening black hole in his chest. They are about the size of the milk bubbles collecting on the edge of my cereal bowl. One of them pops. Crack. I drop my spoon. What's next? To school. Yes, I must plan my way to class. I have to catch the number 44 bus southbound from the from the bus stop 67 paces from my apartment. The bus leaves at 0843. I must leave my apartment no later than 0836 to allow for any unforeseen deviance in the schedule. Complacency kills. Crack. The door to the bus snaps open, and I wait for a frail woman to disembark clutching a brown tote and a copy of today's newspaper. I wait, listening to the whine of the bus engine, its hot fumes reeking of petroleum. A hydraulic valve releases a hiss like that of a nitrous canister in a dentist's office, right before you are fitted with a mask. It's whispering at me, like the hiss of the stretcher as the medical team raises the bed up level with the helicopter door, ready to be ridden by a 19-year-old Marine, as ready as he was for his first ride in the car his parents bought him when he turned 16 just three years ago. I know that is how I must be today, ready, ready to ride that bus, ready for anything to happen, ready for that moment just after the crack when the tires start shrieking and the glass starts breaking and the metal starts twisting and tearing, metal propelled haphazardly through the air, racing, twirling, searching, seeking out a lung for it to perforate. Always you must be ready for an IED because complacency kills. I am awake. And now what? After the bus. I must know this before my feet hit the ground, before my bedtime sanctuary is abandoned. How do I prepare for class? As a child, getting ready for school was much more linear. Make sure I had my lunch, my books, my homework. Try not to forget my sweatshirt and my locker. Try not to get picked, try to get picked for the good kickball team during lunch. But now everything is different. Now I must try not to get picked for anything at all. I try not to draw any more attention to myself than I already do. I am five years senior to my average classmate, and with my arms branded in military tattoos, I stand out. In Iraq, it was never good to stand out. In Iraq, we wear combat boots to support our ankles, to protect our feet, to kick down doors. Now I must choose footwear that makes the least amount of noise as they batter against the linoleum floor in the classroom. My legs churn up and down with anxiety, far too fierce to control, pumping like the pistons of a turbine engine, my heels launching and landing with a rhythmic thud on the cold ground. I hear the rotors. I smell the chemicals used by the morning janitor to wipe the floors clean, the smell of the chemicals used to wipe the blood from the floor of that tent hospital. I can feel the hair on my neck rise up as I think of the tension in that casualty receiving bay, the confusion, the chaos, the noise, the movement, like walking through a courtyard on campus, everyone going somewhere, everyone doing something. What is my something? What is my mission now? To get home, to leave this school that reeks of ammonia and blood, this campus that's teeming with people that I don't know, whose missions are a mystery to me. Yes, I must get home to my bed, my sanctuary, to sleep. I need more sleep. Crack, the textbook on the desk next to mine slams shut. Class is over. It's time to go home. Home. Yes, it is time to go home. Time to go to my apartment, 67 paces from the 44 bus stop. It's time to come home, in, out of the throbbing heat, in from the gritty air and that stench of JP5 and rubber. Yes, it's time to come home, to come back to a life of friends and family, 
safety, comfort, kickball, and paper bag lunches. I come home to my apartment, 67 paces from the bus stop, and my Marines are there waiting for me, laughing, drinking, all of them stuffed into my shabby living room as if we were back at the barracks, oogling the new Boots Facebook pictures of his girlfriend at home. All of us there, even the ones that didn't come home. But no, that's not right. That's not home. That's just a dream, a hazy half memory of a time before, a flickering thought of what would never be. My bed is my home, my blankets. There I am safe, there I am home. I am alone, I am awake. Crack, my feet touch the bedroom floor. Thank you guys.